All right, this is lesson 5.3, derivatives of inverse functions. There's going to be a kind of a unique formula that we develop here. It's a little confusing for students, but as long as you realize the basic premise, I think that you're probably going to be okay. So let's start. So in this picture here, we have a function f and a function f inverse. And if you know the properties of inverses, we're switching the x and y coordinates. And so it's going to be reflected about this y equal to x line. Now what happens if we take a point AB that's on f of x? If we mirror that, it's going to be BA on the inverse since we switched x and y. We want to draw the tangent line to each one of the points through... Uh, to each one of the curves at those points. So let's see what happens. Notice first of all that for f of x, f of x is an increasing function. If we take the inverse of an increasing function, we're going to end up with an increasing function. Oh, that seems a little weird, but no, that's true. And in fact, if you take a decreasing function, strictly decreasing, the inverse of that will be a decreasing function. So when I take the inverses, their derivatives are going to have the same sign. Oh, interesting. Well, look at this red line right here now. That red line is going to be a positive slope. And then this blue line here, that's the tangent to the inverse function through BA. Do you notice anything that's happening there? Well, I noticed this right here. That point, where is that point where the two tangent lines intersect? Yes, yeah, y equal to x. So they're going to have a commonality there. Also, the red line is increasing and the blue line is increasing, so both have positive slopes, like I just talked about. Let's do something quick here. Let's call this point CC. There is going to be an intersection point of the two tangent lines on y equal to x. So if I do the slope on the f of x, that's going to be, well, I got my b minus c, so I'm just taking this point here and this point here all over a minus c. And then if I take the slope of f inverse of x, I'm going to end up with, okay, so here's my y, so it's going to be a minus c over b minus c. What do you notice? Yes, they are reciprocals. So the slope on the graph of f at a, b, and f inverse at b, a, they're going to be reciprocals. Notice we did not use the word opposite. That would be for some two lines that are perpendicular. These are not perpendicular. And we said that the inverse of an increasing function is also an increasing function, so they're always going to have the same sign as well. So let's go down here to example one. f of x is equal to the square root of x. So I have this point here, and then we go out to four. There we have that. There is my square root function. And then find f inverse. Now, notice this is just one piece of a parabola turned on its side. So find the inverse. We switch x and y. And then I solve for y. So y is equal to x squared. Now, if you notice this, this has two pieces of the parabola. I only want one piece. This is the positive piece over here. So I need to restrict the domain for x greater than or equal to 0. Make sure that you do include that. So f inverse is equal to x squared, where x is greater than or equal to 0. That's my inverse function. I have a graph here now. Now differentiate both these, and let's look at what happens with those derivatives. So for f prime, I get 1 over 2 squared of x, because that comes from up here. And then for f inverse... I end up with just 2x because I'm working right here. Now part E is pretty key. Notice when I say f of x, I'm dealing with the point 4, 2. When I talk about f inverse, I'm talking about the point 2, 4. This is the only thing I can plug in there with the 2. This 4 is the only thing I can plug into this function because it's of x. And so you have to keep track of the x's and y's. And that's the hardest thing that you have to deal with for this. But if I do find the slope now, I got f prime of 4 is equal to 1 over 2 square root of 4. That's 1 fourth. If I do the other function, the inverse, f inverse prime of 
2, notice it's the x coordinate now on the inverse function, equals 2 times 2, which is just 4. Notice, notice. Yes, reciprocals, and they're both positive. They're both the same sign. Either both positive or both negative. There you go. So that shows you what happens. And then, like I said, the key is using the appropriate x value at the right time. What conclusions? Once again, they are reciprocals. And so it, it, it makes sense, too, because you're switching x and y. So to get to the inverse function, you just switch x and y from f of x. And so when you switch those, you, you're really going delta y over delta x. Now you do the inverse function. It's going to be delta x over delta y. You're just going to be doing the reciprocal. And that's what's happening for us. Here's where we get bogged down in notation a little bit, though. Derivatives of inverse functions. If a, b is on f then we know that BA is on F inverse. So if I want to find the derivative of the inverse, I have to be plugging in the X coordinate of F inverse into my function. That would be the inverse X value. But when I take the reciprocal, look at here, this is just plain F. So then I have to plug in the A, which is the X coordinate on F. So if you just keep that straight, X coordinate on the respective function, then you should be okay. Now here's where people get messed up a little bit, though you get g prime of x is equal to 1 over f prime of g of x. Well notice that x is the x coordinate on g, well that means that g of x is going to be the y coordinate on the inverse. That's if f and g are inverse functions of each other. So it does make sense, you just got to get your head around it. Derivatives of inverses have reciprocal slopes at image points. Points reflected across y equal to x. a, b, and b, a are our image points. So let's look at example number two. I'm using a different color, trying purple now. Let f and g be inverse functions such that we have a bunch of f points here. And then we also have a bunch of f prime points. What's really nice to do is to write out which points are on which functions. So if I do talk about f, on f, I'm going to have the point negative 1, 1. How do I know that? From right here. And then at that point, I know that my slope is going to be 3 halves. How do I know that? Right there. So I can do that for each one of these sets of points. Pause this and do that. Now let's talk about g. With g now, all I have to do is realize that like this is like a and b here. So I just have to flop those around. So now I'm going to have b a on g, and what does that do to my slope? Well, that's going to flip this over. So I'm going to take the reciprocal and get 2 thirds. Do this point, 2, 0. And so then the slope would be 1 half. And then if I take this point, 5, 1, this x coordinate, 5, is on g then we're going to get a slope of 2. See how that works? If you write these things out like this, I think that it helps you a lot. So then it answers these questions quite easily. g prime of 1. There's my 1 for my x-coordinate, so I'm going to get 2 thirds. Try the rest of these yourself now. So if you look at this, this is just 1 half. You should be able to read that from over here. But then g prime of 3, I don't know. And g prime of 0, I don't know. That has nothing to do with this problem right here because the x coordinate on g is 0. I don't have information for that. And then g prime of 5 is going to be my 2 there. Now, this can be really powerful because you can figure out what a function is doing or an inverse function, what it's doing without even finding the inverse function. In and around a certain area, locality, you can see what the inverse function is doing. Awesome. In fact, we can make tangent line approximations for that without even finding the inverse function. Okay, the last piece. If function f has an inverse function, f inverse, then f is 1 to 1. 
and must be either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing on its entire domain. So to have an inverse, it has to be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing if it is a continuous function. That's what we're looking at. So for instance, if I look at the sine function right here, in pre-calculus, we studied that the inverse of the sine function is just this little, little piece like this. Well, that's because we restricted the domain of the sine function to be only the strictly increasing part. So that's what we might have to do at certain times. But we only have an inverse if we are strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. So we want to look at this example A. Use f prime to show that f of x equals 6x minus x cubed is not one to one on its entire domain. So if I show that the derivative is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, I should be good to go. Why don't you try that too? So I get x squared is equal to two, so x is equal to plus or minus square root of two. So I can set up my number line here for f prime, and I'm gonna have negative square root of two, and I'm gonna have positive square root of two, and if I figure out what this looks like, oh, this is just a parabola. Oh, it opens down. That tells me the sign here of f prime. So I'm going to be negative here, positive here, and negative here. So what that tells me is that it is not one to one because my derivative changes signs over the real uh, all over the set of all real numbers. How did we show that? That's because f is not one to one, or f is not one to one because f prime is both positive and negative on that set over real numbers. So then it says, find the largest interval containing x equal to zero for which f is one to one. Well, that would be right in here. So that would just be from negative square root of two to square root of two. Then find the largest interval where x is equal to negative two is contained in there for which f of x has an inverse function. Well, negative two is over here, so that's just gonna be negative infinity up to negative square root of 2. Now what I did not do though is I did not do the largest interval here. This should be a square bracket because I can start at negative 2 and the point to the right of it is going to be higher than what it was at negative square root of 2 because I am increasing here. And similarly I can include this because any point to the left of that will be below it. And then here we never include infinity, so we leave that round, but I can include that there. So those are the largest intervals that we can use for where we have an inverse function. That's limiting the domain, similar to what we used to do with the sine function up there. All right, I hope that this helps you and you understand this all right. Thanks very much for watching and have a great day.